Hey, welcome back to Mobility Wad. Today we're gonna do a paradigm shift. We're gonna make a paradigm shift. We're gonna switch from this conversation about getting more sleep, shame on you, you're not sleeping enough, to sleep quality, sleep density. And that's really what we're gonna talk about today. How do I improve the quality of my sleep? We see and work with a lot of professional athletes, professional go-getters, high-level people, and moms and dads with little children in businesses, and it turns out, Everyone feels like they need more sleep. In fact, it's sort of like a meme. Like, did you get enough sleep? Are you sleeping enough? Uh, and what we're not talking about is, A, controlling the amount of sleep I get in a different way. Can I increase the quality of my sleep? Can I increase the density of that sleep? And that always gives me a chance to focus on something that I can control. Because if I have to get up early in the morning for a, a trip, if I'm sleeping before a competition, if I have little babies, you know, all of those things can throw off my sleep. So let me give you a couple examples. Um, working with Altus, there are our kids down, there used to be the World Athletic Center, and uh, Jeremy Koenig, who we've had on, this, on the show before, talking about um, you know, the application of genetics, has a program he calls Iris, and what he did was, it's one of, the, one of the things around Iris is about tracking sleep with his athletes. So they asked about 23 Olympians or so, give or take a handful, do you get enough sleep? And to the athlete, they were all like, yes, we all sleep enough because we're Olympians and this is our job and we sleep enough and they, I think they made it like nine hours of baseline right well it turns out a hundred percent of those athletes did not get enough sleep in fact and that we've seen in all our trackings whoop or any other data tracking that athletes always self-report more sleep than they actually get in reality and which leads us to believe that no matter what happens, at some point, it's really difficult to get enough sleep, that we're distracted, we're work, we're, we gotta, we gotta get a little extra time in. One of the things that we know in the military is that you cannot control your sleep. And so lecturing blindly about, hey, get more sleep, you know, you're like, hey guys, thanks very much, that is not helpful. So what is helpful? Controlling the density of my sleep. So here's what we're gonna talk about today, some behaviors that focus on improving the density and the quality of your sleep. And number one, we're gonna start this thing, this sleep timeline, we're gonna start at four o'clock. And 4 p.m. is gonna become our cutoff for caffeine. So we wanna go zero caffeine after 4 p.m., okay? And now, don't get me wrong, I understand there's some times where you're gonna need that little bump to go, but what we know is that caffeine and alcohol dramatically affect my sleep quality. And you may be, your genetics are a fast caffeine metabolizer, I get it, but if you make this commitment to try to limit your caffeine after 4 p.m., that leaves you the rest of the day to be an espresso-holic, right Dave? Uh, yes, absolutely. True fact, and I'm not asking you to drink less coffee, I'm just saying, hey, curtail your coffee at four o'clock. Second piece, in times of peak stress, in times of large demand on your life, let's limit drinking. That alcohol, right, that alcohol dramatically affects our sleep quality. Now, Crucial is that we see a lot of adults out there who are using a glass of wine for down regulation. And they're like, it's the way that I'm able to turn off my brain after going, 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 going. We're gonna talk about some other strategies to get you to down regulate a little bit. But one of the big things we can know is that in times of peak stress, sleep deprivation times where I'm traveling, that alcohol does affect the quality of your sleep. And if you look at heart rate variability or recovery or cardiac function, you can correlate that one to one. The kids at WHOOP, W-H-O-P, they're tracking, they found that able to show a dramatic re reduction in their drinking in their athletes that they followed because the athletes could actually see the impact on their cardiac function even up to four days later, okay? So I'm not saying don't drink, I'm just saying understand that if times of peak stress it's going to affect your sleep, make a big decision about that. So can I limit my alcohol the same way that I'm thinking would be responsibly about uh, no caffeine? So I'm not saying go dry, I'm saying that it does affect the quality of your sleep. So now, we've made a couple decisions around some lifestyle pieces. Now, what this means then is that we start to roll up to pre-bed, the pre-bed routine. And what we want people to understand is that your brain begins to understand when you're starting to go to bed. It starts to set up routine, our circadian rhythms going. Most people are sort of agnostic about reading the signs that they know to sleep. And we've got Netflix and, and all the other things happening. One of the things that we can do regularly that gives us a good boost towards improving sleep density is doing soft tissue work before we go to bed. So pre-bed, what I'm saying is before you go to the bedroom, 
The things you can do in your living room, right, is eight to 10 minutes. And you see I'm even giving you a little bit of dose. If I was really being mean, I'd say 10 minutes. Eight to 10 minutes of soft tissue work. And we like gut smashing, but it doesn't matter if you're smashing your guts or rolling your quads. Any of that soft tissue work on a roller, on a lacrosse ball, it's going to give your body some parasympathetic input. And we start to develop a bedtime routine. Mags, did you have a bedtime routine with your kids? Yes. Yes. You do things like have a bath. Read a bedtime story, right? And what ends up happening is the kid is like, I know what this is. I'm getting ready to go to bed. I just had a warm bath. I just read a book with my mom. It's dark outside. Shoot, my brain's like sleep. And what we want to do with our adult selves is give ourselves a little bedtime routine. And one of the things that you can begin to correlate, and your brain is smart enough to pick this up, is you get 10 minutes of soft tissue work before you go to bed. Not only is that a good time to put it in because there's really not much productive things happening before you go to the bed in the last 10 minutes before that transition happens, but also you will sleep better. Just like getting a massage and wanting to pass out, having a nap afterwards, you'll see the same thing, all right? So put your eight to 10 minutes of soft tissue work here. Then we can think about how do I have sleep hygiene? So what's the hygiene of the room? What's the room look like? Well, remember, we want to sleep in cold, dark places. So our idea is, hey, 62 to 68 degrees, the room should be cool. Now, the you can be a little extreme. I sleep on something called a chili pad, and it circulates 55 degree water underneath my sheet all night long. Juliet loves to go to sleep. I know, Mag's freaking out. Juliet loves to sleep in a sweatshirt. We have a dividing line that is the great white wall. And on my side of the bed, it is ice cold. On her side of the bed, it's as hot and steamy as she wants to make it. It doesn't matter because I like to sleep where it's rock cold and a lot of good friends have experienced this too. Bottom line though, if you can cool off your room, you are going to sleep better. And so um, 62 to 68 degrees. Now this starts to matter because if I'm traveling, I can start to make sure that the room has the same context every single time, which we'll talk about a little bit further. So the room is 62 to 68 degree. It has to be dark. And when I mean dark, I mean as dark as your worst heart self. Dark, dark, dark. The research is that if there has a single light source in your room, even a red, red LED, a little flashing light, your brain will pick it up and, and it will dis disrupt your sleep. There's good correlation between sleep apnea and light pollution in your room. So one, if you can't have blackout shades, get rid of all the light sources that you can. And if you can't control the room, because let's say you live in a mid-century modern house that's glass, then you put on this thing called an eye mask, right? So what we're thinking is dark, and that could be eye mask. If you can't get it quiet, get earplugs. What we're trying to do with the eye mask and the earplugs, or the quietness, or the, or the ambient white noise, and the darkness is we're getting, once again, setting up conditions where our brain feels familiar. Our brain starts to recognize patterns, and we know that this is the thing that's about to happen. So look what happens here. We've got 10 minutes of soft tissue work. The room is cold. I've got it dark. I can throw in things like from our friend Stacy Sims, tart cherry juice. Tart cherry. You can buy this at GNC or any online and a little chug, chug of this tart cherry will help drop core temperature. Uh, create the melatonin that you're looking for to sleep naturally. It's easy and non-addictive and we can think about dropping core temperature. So can I, if I'm hot, I guarantee you, you're not gonna sleep well, true fact. If I need to jump in a cold shower and drop my core temperature a little bit, I can. Even just cooling off a little bit will make a difference. So look what happens now. What we've done, oh God, you know what? I hate to say it, I've saved the worst for last. And that is this, this is crucial, no, phone. You have got to get your phone out of the bedroom. Do you sleep with your phone in the bedroom, Max? Duh. Dave? Yep. Duh. Dave, you have problems sleeping sometimes, don't you? I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It turns out that one of the problems with the phone is not only it's ambient light, I know that you can turn that off. LED light has been shown to really disrupt our circadian rhythms. It messes us up. Penetrates the pineal gland. Your brain is like, what is going on? Wakes up. 
turn on the, uh, the, the night saver mode on your, your smartphone, it, it has one. Turn it on at dusk, no matter what. So you're at least pulling out the blue light. You can wear the blue blocker glasses. They're making cooler ones now. You can get them on if you want to cruise around in your yellow glasses at home like a nerd. Deep nerds, I see you. But uh, the very least, turn that blue blocker glass uh, light remover on your, uh, on your phone. But the big deal is with the phone is that that wake up, that text, that look for it, gives me a serotonin boost where my brain is looking for novel concept, ding, novel stimuli, and that really does disrupt sleep. The best thing we can say is get a red alarm clock from CVS, from, from Walgreens, it's red numbers, won't wreck your night vision, and then turn it upside down. Keep the phone out of the room. One of the things we're always trying to do is take away choices so that I don't have to choose to not look at my phone. My phone is just not in the room. In our house, all phones, all technology is out of the bedroom. There's no TV in the bedroom. One time, as an anecdote, we had an athlete who was having chronic knee pain problem. We couldn't chase it down. Something was wrong. Her heart rate variability was off. They're like, hey, you're not recovering. You're not adapting well. Tell me about your sleep. It turns out when she was by herself without her boyfriend, she slept with the TV on all night long. And uh, she says, like, I feel really comfortable with the TV on. Well, it turns out she was just nuking herself, not getting very good quality sleep, even though she was sleeping. So here's the rules. Let's control sleep density. And what ends up happening now is that I start to create the same situation every single night. A little tart cherry juice, there's no phone, I get some soft tissue work in, the room is cold, the room is dark, and my brain knows that I have not disrupted it with caffeine or drinking, that it's time to go to bed. If I travel, I can set up the same situations, so that even though I'm in a foreign environment, my brain knows that I'm about to go to sleep. We take this a step further, we'll recommend that if you're traveling on the airplane, go ahead and bring a pillowcase with you from home, and guess what, you're, suddenly your pillow smells like your own den, your own fox hole where you're sleeping with your family and your dogs and your cats and that that smell your brain starts to pick up on that you're not in some alien environment our tour de france guys often will travel with their own mattress the team sky um, a british cycling pioneer realizing that their athletes were sleeping on different surfaces every night during the tour de france which was affecting their sleep quality so they just start traveling with the same mattress and you can extend that say hey i can't travel with my same mattress can i travel with my own pillow yes i can i can travel with my own pillow if i can't i travel with my own pillow case, but really that's allegory for controlling the environment, trying to have a homogenous ex sleeping experience. So I do the same thing every single night, roughly at the same time. This sleep density suddenly means that the sleep I am getting really is much, much better. And so instead of just arguing about sleep more, let's change the conversation to sleep better. See you guys tomorrow.